So in this lecture, we're going to take another step toward phase diagrams, this time talking about how the Gibbs free energy changes with temperature and pressure. And in particular, we're going to be talking about changes in phase. So something worth pointing out here uh, as we begin, uh, something that, again, I as a student found very confusing, and I, I think many people find confusing, is this idea of delta G versus G. OK, G, this is the Gibbs free energy. And that corresponds to the absolute value of the free energy, right? Because if we know the enthalpy of what's inside the system, and we can find that out because if we know what the constituents are and we know how to break them down into their elements and we know the energy to put them together to, for example, turning uh, hydrogen and oxygen into water, we know the delta H and the delta S of reaction, we can figure out G, right? Uh, we also could use heat capacities, et cetera. But that's an absolute value. This delta G, that corresponds to a change in the Gibbs free energy. And what we've been talking about so far is a change in, in which we have you know, some, some free energy curve and we're transitioning you know, down that curve from you know, temperature from one temperature to another and that distance is delta G. Another thing we could do is we could talk about delta G, G, T, and they have, say, uh, you know, a uh, curve that does that and a curve that does this. And this is a uh, G, whatever, uh, S, and this is going to be a uh, G, you know, L. And now, we can talk about the delta G the difference between two distinct curves. And in this case, we're talking about what's the difference in free energy between a uh, solid and a liquid. And what you may remember from your taking your uh, MSE 316 class, thermodynamics, it was, uh, I guess, thermodynamics and phase transitions, right? And you use the Porter and Easterling book. And uh, what you saw in that is you saw that this delta G is what drives phase transitions. Great. Uh, again, you've seen that kind of before. You've seen uh, the thermodynamics itself. But nonetheless, this delta G can be confusing because it could mean just changing position on a curve, or it could mean changing between two phases. And sometimes, to make it even more confusing, we'll talk about you know, changing along two curves and then changing between the two curves. Nonetheless, this is where things become confusing. You should recognize that it is confusing. And uh, when you're reading or you're working on a problem, uh, be careful with how you use the notation. And in today's lecture, our delta Gs, we're all going to be referring to changing between two curves. And we may have you know, different temperatures on that curve or different pressures. But nonetheless, uh, for a given temperature and pressure, how does the delta G change? So let's. Uh, Let's start by thinking about uh, G is a function of temperature at constant P. OK. Uh, and you know, just for simplicity, think of water. Uh, and uh, say we're at the melting point equals 273. And you know, water is not necessarily the best example, but that's okay. 
Uh, we'll start with that and we'll, we'll point out where it diverges because you know, you'll see water is a little bit weird. Uh, so we have water solid transitioning to water liquid and that's the reaction. So one component system So our delta G is going to be delta G going solid to liquid. So that is the Gibbs of H2O liquid minus the Gibbs of H2O solid. And at the melting temperature, that's equal to zero. Which means if our system's in equilibrium, G H2O liquid, it was in parentheses, I guess, is equal to G H2O solid. Now, kind of as an, as an aside, because uh, we're going to be addressing this in the near future, if these are molar quantities, well, they don't even have to be, but let's call them molar. So it's energy per mole. We can say G of the system is equal to uh, N of solid G H2O solid plus N liquid G H2O liquid. And if we wanted to, we could take all of this. So if you look at that, that's joule per mole. That is mole, which makes this just joule, but I could take this entire equation and divide it by divide it by one over n tot, where n tot is equal to n liquid plus n solid, and in doing that, we now get g system is equal to the fraction of solid G H2O solid plus fraction liquid G H2O liquid. So this is joule per mole. This is now joule per mole, right? Because I divided it by the total number of moles. And this is the fraction of moles and S divided by N tot. So it's the mole fraction, NL. The uh, mole fraction in the case of our system where GH2O solid is equal to GH2O liquid is equal to, just call this uh, G. Uh, H2O EQ, then G system is equal to plus liquid G H2O equilibrium is equal to one, right? Because those have to add to one G H2O equilibrium. Uh, but I point this out because. Uh, in the near future, we're going to be writing out our free energy in terms of the mole fraction of different phases. In this case, we have a solid phase and a liquid phase. Uh, but we're not going to talk about that, about that here. Uh, nonetheless, let's see, let's go back where we were. Okay, so we, we were right 
here. So this is true when we're at T melt. But if we go slightly above that, T above, I almost made it equal to, above 273, okay, then delta G solid to liquid is equal to delta G H2O liquid minus G H2O solid is less than zero, meaning that it right we know that's the case because we know that we we, we talked earlier that uh, delta g is always minimized and if it can spontaneously reduce itself then it happens so we know if that's true that's true which means g h2 o liquid is less than G H2O solid. And vice versa, when T is less than 273, G H2O liquid is greater than G H2O solid. So melts, solidifies. So schematically, we could say that G versus T, you'll have a solid line and a liquid line. And where those cross, is the melting temperature. Why do they have this shape? Well, we're zoomed in, right? So everything becomes linear when you zoom into it enough. Uh, that's kind of the lesson from uh, the Taylor series expansion, right? But we know that the G by dt p is equal to minus s and s is always greater than zero which means this slope must always be negative and what's more we know that uh, dg squared dt squared is equal to minus cp p. And that's because s is equal to integral cp t dt. Okay, so we've got that. Another way to represent this would be to represent it as delta G solid to liquid versus temperature. And at that point, our Delta G curve would look something like that. This is delta G solid liquid, T melt. This is delta G equals zero. So 
So above, above T melt, delta G solid to liquid, the Gibbs free energy of melting is less than zero. And that's, that's consistent with, with what we know. It's worth pointing out here, though, that uh, the slope on this, d delta g dt at constant pressure is equal to minus delta s. And you can write out all the equations. You'll see that they, they work out. Uh, and s the liquid is always oof, much higher than S of the solid, always. So the solid minus the liquid is going to be greater than zero. Sorry, other way around. S liquid minus S solid, that's larger. So that means delta S is larger than zero, which means that this slope has to be uh, less than zero because of that negative sign. So let's go back and uh, put this in as more of a big picture where we're looking at the Gibbs free energies. So G is equal to H minus TS G the liquid phase is equal to H liquid minus T S liquid. G solid is equal to H solid minus T S solid. So delta G solid to liquid is equal to delta H solid to liquid minus T delta S solid to liquid is equal to zero at T melt, which means that delta H solid to liquid is equal to T delta S solid to liquid at T melt. OK. So this is, is at equilibrium at the melting point. Let's put some numbers in so we can look at what happens as we move away from the melting point. So taking numbers from the back of your textbook, delta H of melting, that's the <coughs> latent heat of melting, Delta H, whoops, going solid to liquid is equal to 6008 joule per mole. So these are molar quantities. S of liquid at 298 is equal to 70.08 joule per K mole. S of solid is equal to 44.77 joule per K mole. Molar heat capacity at constant pressure of liquid is 75.44 joule per mole K. Uh, 
CP of solid is 38 joule per mole K. And you can go to the back of your text and get uh, a temperature dependent uh, change there, but it's a very small difference. Uh, and from here, delta S of melting is delta H melting over T melt is equal to 22.01 joule per mole K. So this small amount of data, and you know, it's not even good because we're just holding heat capacity constant, but it's good enough to give us a good idea of what's happening at T above T melt. So enthalpy. Okay. H of liquid as a function of temperature is equal to uh, heat of formation And I don't have that. That's actually in the back of your book. Give me one second. Let me look that up. All right. So this this is on the order of uh, minus two hundred eighty-five kilojoule per mole. And I realize now the reason I didn't put that in my notes is that is going to eventually disappear. But let me. Nonetheless, let, let's, let's just carry it through here. So that's the enthalpy of creating water from hydrogen and oxygen. Plus the integral from 298 to the temperature of interest, Cp of the liquid, dt. So that is uh, 75.44 T minus 298 plus delta H naught. The enthalpy of the solid as a function of temperature is delta H naught plus the integral 298 to 273 Cp of the liquid dt. So I'm taking it from room temperature down to the freezing point. Then I've got to take the latent heat going from solid to liquid or liquid to solid liquid to solid, which is why I've got the negative sign in there, plus the integral from 273 to T Cp of the solid dt. So that gives us delta H as a function of temperature is equal to 75 times 273 minus 298 minus 6008 plus 38 times T minus 273 plus delta H naught. And if you take and have delta H T is equal to delta H L minus delta H S, you get 37.44 T minus 
four, two, one, three. And notice that the uh, delta H naught, those cancel each other out because you subtract. And that's why I didn't have that in the original data set. So, whoop. So that gives us now an expression for the enthalpy as a function of temperature. And, you know, graphically, H versus T to 73. Uh, this is 298. And this is, you know, some arbitrary temperature, which can be anywhere here, right? But uh, some arbitrary temperature. And I've got curves that look like this. And, you know, we know that the slope of the liquid has to be greater than the slope of the solid because the heat capacity of a liquid is higher. And our path for finding the enthalpy of the liquid was to start at 298 and come down to our temperature of interest. And our path for determining the enthalpy of the solid was to start with the liquid at 298, because we can find the enthalpy of formation there, take the liquid down to the transition, transition down to the solid, and then take the solid back up to here. So now we have delta H as a function of temperature. So now we can take and do this with the entropy. And in the case of the entropy, S of the liquid is S of the liquid at 298 plus integral from 298 to T Cp of the liquid over T dt s liquid is equal to uh, plugging in numbers here 70.08 plus 75.44 natural log of t over 298 and in the case of the solid, you get S solid 298 plus integral 298 T CP over T solid DT. And note here that these are distinct, unlike uh, Um, unlike uh, here, where there are both the enthalpy of formation of the liquid at 298, these are just two separate values that we can uh, identify. Um, and I didn't put, I didn't put that in here. Uh, well, this is also in the back of the book. Uh, if you substitute in, you get S of the solid is equal to 44.77 
plus 38 natural log t over 2 98 delta s solid to liquid is equal to delta s liquid minus delta s solid is equal to 25.31 plus 37.44 natural log of t over 298. Okay. And graphically, this, oh, this gives us S versus T. And we have two curves with this shape to them. That's the liquid, that's the solid. And this is 298. And for each of these, we integrate it down. until we came to T. So that is delta S as a function of T. And we can go back now and have our Delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. Which means that uh, this gives us delta G going solid to liquid as a function of temperature is minus four, two, one, three, plus three, seven, four, four, T minus T times 25.31 plus 37.44 natural log of T over 298. So delta G solid to liquid as a function of temperature is equal to minus 4213 plus one, two, one, three, T plus 37.44 T natural log T over two ninety eight, And this is joule per mole. So now if you wanted to, you could go in and plug in temperature and determine the delta G as a function of temperature as you move away from the melting point. And graphically, this looks like T, we have some Delta G, T, melt. And up here, we have Delta H, solid to liquid. And T, Delta S, solid to liquid there. And at that point, those two have to be equal to each other. So the next topic that I'd like to touch on is how does Gibbs free energy change when temperature is held constant, but P is varied? So, uh,
delta G solid to liquid change when T constant P varied. Okay, we go back and write down our equation. DG is equal to S dt plus V dp plus mu dn. We're holding temperature constant. We're holding the composition constant. So this gives us the differential of Gibbs free energy is V dp. Okay. So we can put little subscripts in front of that. And uh, in doing that, so we'll put a little, put little uh, subscripts down here. And, sorry. And here. And that will let us write volume of the liquid phase is equal to dg of the liquid dp, a constant temperature, and V of the solid phase is equal to change in the Gibbs free energy of the solid, the change in pressure at constant temperature. Oops. Okay. So the D delta G dp, so that's the uh, slope of the change in the free energy going from solid to liquid. And we're going to say T equals T melt constant. Is equal to delta V going solid to liquid which is less than zero for most uh, materials. Not always, we'll come back to that, right? So this is, uh, okay. So that means, that V liquid minus V solid is greater than zero. And again, this is true for most materials. This means that, sorry, D by DP of G liquid minus G solid Hang on, I got something wrong up here. I want to fix this. Delta V going solid to liquid is greater than zero for most materials. That's because V of the liquid minus V of the solid is typically larger than zero. Not all, but for most. That means that D by DP of G liquid minus G solid is greater than zero, meaning that dG liquid by dP is greater than dG solid by dP. So that means that if we have a curve of Gibbs free energy as a function of pressure, and again, this is some liquid that happens to have a melting point at, uh, well, T melt and at one atmosphere. So we have, you know, the, the place where we know they cross. We'll have something that looks like liquid. And that is T 
melt. So the slope of Gibbs with li of liquid with respect to temperature has to be greater than the slope of the solid with respect to temperature. Now, if we continue on this vein and we say, change both temperature and pressure, okay, well, GL is equal to Gibbs of the solid. So DGL is equal to DGS. I mean, you know that. That's going to be minus S of the liquid DT plus V of the liquid DP is equal to minus S of the solid DT plus volume of the solid DP. And if we take all of this and we multiply it by one over DT, then we get minus S of the liquid plus V of the liquid DP by DT is equal to minus S of the solid plus V of the solid DP DT, which is equal to S of the solid. So I'm gonna take uh, this over here and this over here. So we get S of the solid minus S of the liquid is equal to V of the solid minus V of the liquid dp dt. So here we have dp by dt is equal to s to the solid minus s to the liquid over v of the solid minus v of the liquid is equal to and we can swap that if we want to, right? Because we can change the signs, but uh, This is delta S uh, right because so you can pull the negative sign out. So that's delta S uh, solid to liquid over delta V solid to liquid. Yep. So we're gonna keep going here, but I want to remind you that even though this is math, you should also keep a physical picture in your head uh, of a system with a certain amount of you know, liquid and a certain amount of you know solid floating in that liquid. And they have a certain volume, and they have an enthalpy. So they, they have physical properties. So don't get too distracted by the math. Uh, and remember, right here at uh, Pulling this at the transformation point, the place where the Gibbs of the liquid and the solid are equal to each other. And that's something that's uh, worth keeping in memory as well as we go forward here. So uh, here, delta G is equal to zero is equal to delta H minus T delta S, which means that delta S is equal to delta H over T. Okay, that means we can substitute delta S in here and get dP by dT in equilibrium. 
is equal to delta H over T delta V. And we know we have that uh, you know, delta H solid is a liquid is equal to H liquid minus H solid, which is typically greater than zero. I can't think of examples otherwise. Uh, and delta V solid to liquid is equal to V liquid minus V solid, which typically is true, you know, water being the odd example. So what this expression is telling us is the shape of the pressure temperature uh, interface in a uh, phase diagram, right? So pressure versus temperature and say we've got a one component system. Now, normal one component systems will look something like this. So you can have a solid over here, a liquid over here, a gas or what a vapor over here. So you'd have something that goes solid into liquid into gas at some, you know, one ATM. Uh, this is normal. Uh, you can have anomalous systems and water is a very good example of that. If delta V solid liquid is less than zero, and that means that this curve is now gonna be shifted because it has to have, it has to have a negative slope. So the normal situation is a positive slope. The anomalous or the weird situation, when you have a, a solid that is less dense than its liquid, that makes a negative slope. Okay, so the next topic that I'd like to talk about in this lecture is the equilibrium, the case of the equilibrium between the vapor and uh, solid phase. So that would be uh, that in our phase diagram. So we've covered uh, during the first half of this lecture, uh, that. So now let's talk about, uh, well, I shouldn't call it a vapor solid. I should call it condensed phase. Uh, it's either this or, or this. Anytime that you've got a vapor in contact with a high density phase, liquid or solid. So let's call this uh, and condensed phase. Liquid or solid, condensed phase. Okay. Well, thing to point out, delta V. This is the change in volume for evaporation. And this 
delta H is enthalpy of evaporation or you know, sublimation in the case of a solid going to a gas. And what makes the vapor phase significantly different is that the vapor is gargantuan compared to the, the condensed phase, right? If you think about you know, a glass of water on the table, when it evaporates, you know, the water vapor goes everywhere, uh, whereas uh, in the condensed phases, it's relatively small, right? You or maybe not a glass of water in the room, but a glass of water in a in a uh, in a box, right? You you still fill the box, and what this means is it means this delta V. If we can just approximate that is the volume of the vapor, right? Because you subtract them, but it's really not that significant. And what this means is that if we go back to our dp dt in equilibrium and that derivation from one phase to the next that's still valid right there was nothing in the derivation that said what well, had to be solid or water uh, so solid or liquid h over t v vapor And if we approximate PV equals N RT, then this brings us to DP by DT is equal to delta H P over N RT squared. So, Moving that around, we'll have dP over P is equal to delta H over RT squared dT. This is the clausius clapeyron equation. And oops, we could take that and integrate it to get the natural log of P is equal to minus delta H over RT. Oh. You can also take and rearrange that to get the pressure is equal to x of minus delta H over RT. So what is this P? Well, that P is the partial pressure. Or the pressure of the gas, right? You've got your system and you've got whatever your solid or liquid or what have you, and this is evaporating. And at some point it stops evaporating. Well, it doesn't really stop evaporating, but as things evaporate, other molecules are condensing back into your solid or liquid but it reaches a point of equilibrium. And that point of equilibrium is this, this pressure, that's the partial pressure. So the thing about this relationship is that it tells us that lower delta H results in higher P, which makes sense, right? This is telling us that as we 
reduce the enthalpy required for evaporation, there's got to be more evaporation. So something that has a uh, something that has a relatively uh, high partial pressure in equilibrium is also going to have a low enthalpy of transformation. So let's look at the functional form of this, right? Let's uh, take delta H of transformation. Is equal to delta H at 298 plus integral from 298T of delta Cp dt, right? So that is delta Cp is equal to Cp of the solid minus, or sorry, forget the direction I'm going here. Uh, Cp of the, uh, well, I guess this is a vapor phase minus Cp of the uh, whatever solid or liquid, liquid solid. And you can substitute in all of your things and you'll, you'll see that it simplifies to this expression. And I, I think it's self-explanatory, but you, you should uh, look at it. And, you know, if you want to, you can think about it again as a uh, picture in which you've got different curves. And if you want the Delta H here, then you can take uh, and trace down and across. And in that case, this is gonna be the integral Cp of the vapor, and this is integral Cp of the liquid or the solid. Nonetheless, you get the idea. Uh, so if we have this as our delta H, that means that we can go back to our dp by p is equal to delta h at 298 plus delta cp 298 minus t we just took it to be a a, a simple simple a, a constant heat capacity over r t squared dt which when we expand this out, it becomes delta H of 298 over R T squared plus delta CP times 298 over R T squared minus delta CP over T R all times DT. which when you integrate, let me integrate that side, you get the natural log of the pressure is equal to minus H delta H 298 plus 298 delta CP over RT minus delta CP over R natural log of T plus a constant. And this has the functional form of natural log of P is equal to A over T plus B natural log of T plus C. So A, B, and C. And these are experimentally fit coefficients. And this is exactly the form that matches uh, table, at least in my textbook, is table A4 in
in the Gaskell Appendix. Now, the final topic I would like to talk about is going to be solid L, uh, solid transformations, solid solid equilibrium. It's everything we're doing here is, is about where are two phases in equilibrium so that we can use that to map out phase diagrams, right? So going back, we have dp by dt is equal to delta h t delta v. Okay, so. Treating delta H and delta V as independent of temperature, uh, you know, and again we're at the equilibrium point, so yeah, we get P is equal to delta H over delta V natural log T. Right? We didn't substitute in the uh, PV equals nRT plus the constant. Okay, remember this is going to be delta H of solid one going to solid two and delta V of solid one going to solid two. So the change in the crystal structure is going to be giving you the change in, in density. Um, so if we take, we can take the exponential of this and get of P minus C delta V over delta H is equal to T. You get the equilibrium temperature. And separating this out a little bit more, we get T EQ is equal to exp of P delta V over delta H minus C delta V over delta H. So in the case of solid to solid phase transitions, this ratio of delta V over delta H is uh, very important. I mean, look, this, this is you know, the crux of this equation, right? So it has to be what's important. And kind of the interesting observation here is that larger delta H means smaller, uh, well, pressure dependence. equilibrium. So this is basically telling you if you've got a, a solid and you put it under pressure, how is that going to cha change the equilibrium temperature? Can you suppress it? Uh, and the larger the latent heat of transition is, the less effect pressure has. If instead you have something which has a very small latent heat of transition going from one solid to the next, then that means it's easier to be able to use pressure to shift the phase transition temperature. And this is where we're gonna stop now. I think we've done a pretty good job of mapping out uh, the free energy space for temperature and pressure in Gibbs free energies. And the rest now is just a matter of plugging in data.